We are lucky to have the Honorable Merrick Garland with us in a fireless fireside chat with the Honorable Kenneth Polite. Uh, Kenneth is a friend to many of us. Uh, he's been here before. He was a U.S. Attorney for New Orleans. He was Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division. He was an AUSA in the Southern District of New York. He's practicing now at Sidley. Kenneth delivered a keynote at the Institute a couple years ago and is one of the most dynamic and inspiring speakers that we've ever had the pleasure to have. Uh, I first met Merrick Garland almost 30 years ago when I was the junior prosecutor on the Oklahoma City bombing team and Merrick was the principal deputy attorney general, principal associate deputy attorney general and the leader of the Oklahoma City bombing team. I was pretty much fresh out of law school and to me, Merrick Garland epitomized what a prosecutor should be. He had a razor sharp focus on getting to the truth and he followed the facts and the law wherever they led. In 1997, President Clinton appointed Merrick to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals where he quickly established a reputation as a brilliant jurist, fair-minded judge, and an elegant and impactful writer. He was on the short list for the Supreme Court for every Democratic administration after that, until President Obama finally nominated him to take Justice Scalia's seat when Justice Scalia died in early 2016. Despite the fact that Judge Garland had widespread bipartisan support, Senate Republicans refused to act on his nomination and the Supreme Court functioned with eight justices for the better part of a year. Four years later, President-elect Biden nominated Judge Garland to be Attorney General. Biden made this announcement on January 7th, 2021, the day after the most serious challenge to the rule of law that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. Merrick Garland was the person that the president thought was uniquely qualified to restore integrity to the Department of Justice and its reputation for independence. And then President-elect Biden had this to say when he announced Judge Garland's nomination. I wanna be clear to those who lead this department who you will serve. You won't work for me. You are not the president's or the vice president's lawyer. Your loyalty is not to me. It's to the law, the constitution, and the people of this nation. As Attorney General, Judge Garland has taken these instructions seriously. He's been scrupulous in making decisions based on the facts and the evidence, the law, and on maintaining the independence of the department. He has strived to ensure that there is not even the appearance of political consideration at the Department of Justice. In this fraught, polarized political atmosphere, it's very difficult to accomplish that. In fact, it's probably impossible, considering some of the decisions that Judge Garland has had to make as Attorney General. Here we are in 2024, and the rule of law continues to be under assault. Americans' faith in our most important institutions, including the Department of Justice, continue to be undermined. We are lucky to have Merrick Garland in the seat that he has occupied these past three years. We owe him a debt for this and for his career of public service. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Honorable Kenneth Polite and the Honorable Merrick Garland, the 86th Attorney, of the United, 86th Attorney General of the United States. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. It's, it's good to be back together. It is. Uh, thank you for joining us in sunny San Francisco. Uh, as we all know, this city serves as one of our tech hubs for the nation. Everybody across this country seems to be talking about AI these days. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about uh, how AI connects to the department's work right now. 
Well, the first thing that occurs to me is that the United States has an important lead in this uh, technology, which is going to be important for our economy and our national security. So the Justice Department's first job is to protect uh, that lead and to protect our intellectual property. So I just can announce today uh, that in the Northern District of California, we've unsealed an indictment against a Chinese national who is charged with stealing uh, from Google uh, intellectual property relating uh, and trade secrets uh, relating to uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the charge is uh, further that he uh, stole uh, this intellectual property um, while he was working for uh, two companies uh, based in the People's Republic of China. I want to thank uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of California, Izzy is somewhere. Yeah, Izzy's here. Ah, great, okay. Uh, Izzy Ramsey uh, and his terrific team and the Disruptive Technologies Task Force uh, agents and uh, 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 prosecutors of the Departments of Justice and Commerce uh, who uh, did a terrific job of uh, discovering what was going on and uh, uh, conducting the arrest this morning as well. Um, the Justice Department just will not tolerate uh, the theft of our uh, trade secrets in the area of artificial intelligence. Now, on the broader uh, question about uh, artificial intelligence, look, as with all evolving technologies, mm -hmm. it has pluses and minuses, advantages and disadvantages, great promise and the risk of great harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, is, and as is my want, I would normally start by talking about the harm and the risks. Um, it, you know, we are in the department worried about uh, algorithmic discrimination that mm -hmm. AI can uh, foster. Uh, we're worried about the way in which it can accelerate the cyber attacks mm -hmm. that are happening uh, daily, uh, maybe minutely, uh, on our companies, on our law firms, uh, on, on departments of the government, uh, and, and on our military. And uh, AI accelerates uh, the possibility mm -hmm. of doing this. If you even think of the, about the most rudimentary at least now, of uh, these kind of uh, hacks, uh, phishing expeditions. Right. We now have uh, AI-enabled conversations, which sound as real as any human uh, textual text conversation, the purpose of which is to elicit your password or some set of personal identifying information. Right. Uh, we have to worry about the way in which AI uh, uh, accelerates the risks of fraud, of sextortion, um, and uh, uh, most deeply from a national security point of view, uh, the risk that foreign malign actors uh, will use AI to increase the polarizations of this country uh, and to attack our uh, electoral system. Mm -hmm. On the positive side, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are some positives. Yeah. On the positive side, uh, it also enables us to react in, uh, at light speed uh, to the attacks on our computer systems. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, where it's really no longer possible for human computer operators to fight off the enormous number of hacks that occur uh, constantly. Um, AI uh, really make, can make it possible for us to defend our systems even better than the machine learning uh, systems that we're, that we're using uh, now. So the Justice Department has to respond to this, um, and we are um, uh, starting to try to hire uh, experts in this field, and, and I, I, I no longer mean uh, lawyers who happen to be um, conversant with uh, computer technology. We now are hiring, uh, I think I'm <laughs> zooming here, um, uh, computer scientists. So uh, I've appointed the first uh, uh, chief science and technology officer for the Justice Department, who is a professor of computer science um, at Princeton. Uh, we are looking for more PhDs in computer science to help, help us with this. Um, it's the only way we're going to up our game uh, sufficiently uh, to be able to secure the country and to take advantages of the benefits of AI. That's fantastic. AI is an example of something that's relatively new to the department's work. I, I just wrapped up my third tour of duty in the department. I think this is your fourth tour of duty yeah. in the department. Uh, when you came back this time, what did you find was a, a little bit different and what was, what was the same? Well, I think what's the same, as you well know, is the dedication of the career uh, lawyers and uh, staff of the department uh, to doing the right thing and to doing it in the right way, uh, to, to filtering out the noise of uh, Washington and politics and the noise of every district, 
uh, so that uh, we just do what our, our job is supposed to do. And I'm, I'm really proud uh, to find that that department is still the way it, it was when I was last there. On the change side, uh, like what I found is, and what really concerns me, is the heightened level of threats uh, and the heightened speed of threats against everyone who works in public spaces. Uh, against our judges, against our prosecutors, against our agents, against cops, uh, against local law enforcement of every kind, against uh, election workers. And by, I, I don't just mean uh, elected officials and paid officials, but uh, the volunteers who, who run our elections. Um, democracy can't succeed and cannot work if the people who uh, serve our you know, uh, to make sure that uh, civic life goes on, are, are fearful of their lives. Um, I'm not naive. I, uh, I worked in the Justice Department uh, during some of the worst domestic terrorism attacks uh, that we'd ever had, uh, Oklahoma City bombing, Unabomber attack, Montana Freeman. Um, but what's different now is the speed uh, at which these uh, attacks are accelerating. Um, and the speed at which we accelerate from threats to actual kinetic action. Um, that's what worries me, and that's why our priority uh, is to fight these attacks. Um, every day, we have an all-threats meeting um, uh, at the Justice Department with the FBI, with the intelligence agencies, uh, with our National Security Division. Uh, we call it the scary meeting. <laughs> because that's what it is. Um, and we're just uh, spend the entire day allocating our resources to the respond to that's the uh, kind of uh, threats that we're facing, domestic terrorism, foreign terrorism, and uh, foreign nation states. Let me just follow up on some of the, those high profile cases that you've, you've been involved in in your career. You mentioned Unabomber, you mentioned Oklahoma City. Uh, you've lived a life responding to some of the most high profile threats what lessons did you learn from your involvement in some of those cases, and, and how do you apply some of those lessons to some of the cases that are of, of, of greatest significance right now, our January 6th matters? Well, as you well know, because of your participation in the January 6th uh, investigations, uh, you know, the first point is we know when we have a case of this level of complexity and this level of consequence for the country that we have to get it right. Um, that we have to focus our attention on ensuring that we get it right. That means uh, from the very beginning, uh, imagining the mistakes that we could make and making sure that we don't make them because some of them cannot be recovered later. Uh, that we uh, think about the entire course of the prosecution, the trial, the appeal, so that we fold in the appellate lawyers at the very beginning uh, of the investigation. We ensure uh, that the archetype of a Justice Department investigation where the prosecutors and the agents are working together actually works, that they're working as a team. Uh, so legal and fact development and strategizing and tactics are all worked on uh, from the beginning. Uh, that we pressure test at every stage. We run down every lead we can. And if we look like we're in a blind alley, we move into another uh, uh, a way to go uh, forward. Um, this is the way um, we do, uh, we did Oklahoma City, this is the way we did Unabomber case, the way we're doing January 6th, and this is the way, uh, in the best circumstances, we do every case in the department now. We all saw that you were uh, down in Selma earlier this week, commemorating the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Why was it important for you to be there? So I was 12 years old when um, Bloody Sunday happened. And like millions and millions of America, I watch, of Americans, I watched it on television that night. Nightly news was completely devoted to the photos of the horrific beatings uh, um, um, uh, in Selma uh, for the marchers who were trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, it had such an effect on me but it also had such an effect on the whole country and uh, galvanized um, the voting rights movement. And so uh, within several months, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act uh, in direct response to what had happened. 
Um, the Voting Rights Act gave the Justice Department important tools to ensure that every eligible people, that person would have a chance to vote and have that vote counted. Um, and for many years, we used those tools uh, to ensure that. Now, court decisions, in my view, in, uh, have weakened our, our tools. But nonetheless, we uh, uh, feel uh, an obligation to uh, aggressively use the tools we have. We've doubled the size of the voting section of, uh, of, of uh, Civil Rights Division in order to uh, move forward. Uh, the course of uh, uh, progress in voting rights has never been steady, but we, every one of us has an obligation to move it forward to ensure that the fundamental element of our democracy, the right of people to vote, um, is ensured. The other side of what's also happening here, and I, I just alluded to it before, yeah. is that people you know, the attack is not just on uh, voters, it's now on the people who facilitate the elections. It's the, it's the as I said, it's the election officials, it's the paid workers, um, and it's the volunteers. Yeah. And um, if they are not willing to come out and make sure that our elections go forward in a fair way, we don't, we're not gonna have elections. So it's a major priority of the Justice Department to aggressively pursue the people who are making these threats and, and obviously the ones who are carrying them out. Well, we, we are all thankful to you for your commitment to protecting civil rights, sir. You know that. Uh, you have lived a career of tremendous public service, including nearly 25 years on the D.C. Court of Appeals. It's a long time as a judge. What do you miss about it? Well, I mostly miss um, judicial <laughs> immunity. <laughs> You may have noticed I'm a pretty bad guy. I'm on the wrong side of the V of an enormous <laughs> a lot of cases. number of cases. <laughs> Just something we didn't worry about too much as judges. Um, look, uh, I, sometimes I feel like I personally have a split personality. I like the time that I had as a judge to think deeply about uh, matters, to ensure that we got everything exactly right. Uh, that the writing was uh, clear and, and um, uh, uh, treated uh, respectfully the arguments of the parties. Um, um, but there's disadvantages to being a judge. Uh, uh, it's appropriately so. The passive virtues of the judiciary are that you, uh, you are not an act, you don't reach out and actively take cases. You take the cases that come to you. The cases that come to you come uh, through random number generator. So you may or may not get the case that you want and you can't reach out to do it. And uh, 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 with apologies to people who are waiting for their opinions uh, to come out, uh, they often take a while uh, to come out. <laughs> uh, now every day, if I go to the threats briefing in the morning or I read the reports from our friends in the press about things that the Justice Department is doing or should be doing, uh, if we read it in the morning, the leadership team of the department can do something about it yeah. by the end of the day or by the end of the week or can launch uh, an investigation or litigation that gets us there. And this is not something I yeah. could do a, as a judge. So uh, I miss it some, um, but I'm, uh, I'm very happy I made the choice I did. Yeah. Fantastic. We're, we're happy you made the choice. Okay. So I know a lot of us know about this tradition of, of there being a portrait done of every attorney general, yeah. and then every new attorney general gets to select which of those portraits decorates his or her office during their tenure. I've been in your office a lot of times, so I know yeah. what you have on the yeah. walls, but yeah. could you tell us a little bit about which particular portraits you selected yeah. and why? So I, I chose uh, four portraits. Uh, really of iconic attorney generals of the 20th century. Um, uh, so uh, began with Robert Jackson, who was FDR's uh, attorney general, then became a justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he made a very famous speech about the role of prosecutors, the proper role of prosecutors. Um, uh, early on, one of the first discussions of the fact that we are not just law enforcers, we are also uh, there to provide justice and to ensure that when we do uh, bring a case, we treat people fairly. Uh, we recognize the enormous uh, uh, consequences of, of bringing a case against a citizen and of the enormous power of the prosecutors and that that has to be contained and constrained by the principles of, 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 of prosecution. 
Uh, I did not imagine that actually why he turned out to be even more important uh, was when uh, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine um, and we saw the war crimes that were being committed. We reflected back that one of uh, uh, Jackson's jobs was to be the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. So when I was in Lviv in, in Ukraine and we were talking about models of war crime trials, this immediately came you know, to the fore and people were talking about Jackson all, all the time. Um, uh, two other uh, important portraits, one of Elliot Richardson, who courageously stood for the independence um, of the Justice Department, that's independence from politics, I'm so aware. Uh, during the Watergate era, yeah. and Ed Levy, who was the first post-Watergate uh, Attorney mm -hmm. General, who really started enunciating the norms of the department, uh, the norms of treating like cases alike, uh, the norms of not having different rules for the uh, powerful and the powerless, rich and poor, the importance of keeping politics out of, uh, uh, of what we do, um, uh, which later became uh, encapsulated by the principles of federal prosecution, which former AUSAs here know, but so do all the defense counsels because yes. they're always citing them to us, uh, <laughs> properly so. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, built, uh, you know, the department built uh, uh, on that. Yes. Um, and uh, last but not at all least, Robert Kennedy, yes. uh, who uh, represents the civil rights mission of the Justice Department, who enormously increased the size of the civil rights division in the mm -hmm. department, uh, who fought for civil rights um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, throughout his career, but particularly in the Justice Department, and made sure that the Justice Department's uh, uh, mission included uh, civil rights. Um, civil rights was the original uh, formative purpose of the Justice Department. As you know, it was formed in 1870 uh, during uh, Reconstruction for the first principal purpose of protecting blacks who were being attacked by the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is a continuing element of uh, the responsibility of all Justice Department uh, lawyers. And just to follow up on there, every, everywhere you go or whether you're talking to your, your component heads, you talk about three co-equal priorities of the department, upholding the rule of law, keeping America safe, protecting civil rights. I kind of still remember. I Good job. Debate them, right? <laughs> How does the department's white collar work fit into those three priorities? Yeah, so obviously with respect to protection of civil liberties and civil rights during investigations, following the rule of law during investigations, I would focus now on the protection of the country um, and the protection of the economic institutions of the country that make our other institutions uh, and our success possible. Um, the integrity of those economic institutions uh, uh, depend on um, uh, people uh, uh, believing that uh, uh, everybody is treated equally in the country, that um, our institutions are not undermined by everything from fraud to insider trading, uh, that uh, damages uh, respect for the economic institution. But uh, the, uh, the second element of this is our democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. If people think that, the, that there is a different rule for the powerful and the powerless and the rich and the poor, they lose um, uh, um, respect, uh, not only uh, for the Justice Department and for prosecutors, um, but for uh, the rule of law in the country. Uh, and that's why our first priority in the area of white collar crime is going after individual uh, bad actors. Uh, all of us know that, corp all of us in this room know, that corporations are actually the, the, cons uh, the acts of corporations are the acts of individuals. All of us in this room who have counseled uh, uh, corporations, and I did very early on in uh, my career, know that the greatest deterrence uh, to white collar crime is uh, fear of individual prosecutions of the executives and companies. Um, but the most important element of this is the rule of law, that people see that if a corporate executive is held to account, is imprisoned for a corporate crime, that people are being treated equally that there isn't a, a different set of rules, that like, like circumstances are treated alike, that increases uh, respect for the rule of law. And contrary, uh, without that, uh, people's respect for the rule of law uh, goes down in every, in every element. So, sir, you did a fantastic job with answering all those, all those questions. Uh, <laughs> I saved the, the most difficult for last. 
We all know that you're a big fan of uh, a certain pop star. Oh, jeez. <laughs> if you had to select one, only one, Taylor Swift song <laughs> to be the theme song, the anthem for the Department of Justice right now, what would it be? All right, I have that one, but first, the <laughs> anthem for this group. Uh, some people maybe are nodding their heads, but I'm not sure how many people know. Uh, Taylor Swift uh, wrote a song uh, which uh, explained the uh, benefits of telling your white collar crime to the FBI. <laughs> that song is on Midnight's. Uh, it's called Vigilante Something. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find out what something stands for. So it should, that should be the theme song of uh, the White Collar Crime this Institute. Conference. Okay. Yeah, conference. All right. okay. Uh, with respect to the Justice Department, <laughs> and uh, my favorite song is Shake It Off. Uh, <laughs> See? Okay. It, it means quite a lot, I think, for all of us in the Justice Department. You shake off the outside attacks. You shake off the political stuff that's going on. You do your job. You follow the principles of prosecution. And you follow the rule of law. You had a lot of you had a lot of choices there. Bad blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you'll leave, if you'll just leave a blank space, I'll be able there to fill it. <laughs> uh, well, sir, we are just a couple days away from your three-year anniversary as our attorney general. Uh, and we, we cannot be more honored that you've given your time to be with us uh, today. And the time of a lot of representatives from the department are here as well. Uh, just on a personal note, I just uh, have to say it was an honor of a lifetime to serve with you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our 86th Attorney General, Merrick Garland.